for today's webinar. Let me take uh, my opportunity to welcome everyone here. This is my favorite webinar of the year. It's when we get to review everything that's happened during the legislative session, which runs from January to June. And I am going to try to remind myself not to talk too fast because we do have signers here with us today and uh, we have a lot to cover. So um, let me get started with uh, our learning objectives. For those of you who might have participated in prior webinars where we've reviewed the session um, accomplishments, this is going to follow a similar format. We're going to start by reviewing uh, this year's budget, the budget that runs from April 1st of any given year through March 30th of the following year. And we're going to take a look at both the appropriations in the budget as well as the policy initiatives, which are referred to as Article 7s. After that, we'll take a look at the bills that have passed both the Assembly and Senate, so both chambers. And a few of them the governor has already acted upon and signed into law, but the vast majority are still waiting for her action. So we're going to review uh, the more important, more relevant bills in that category. And then, hoping that we have some time left, we're going to take a look at Niskadiv's forecast for the 2025 legislative session, which is going to be here before you know it. So because we have so much to cover today, I don't think we're going to have an opportunity to uh, take any of the participants off mute and have a dialogue. This is really going to be me sort of marching through all of the policy initiatives and budget items that you need to know about. But please, if you have any questions, as I'm speaking a lot, don't hesitate to put your questions in the chat, as Shannon mentioned. Um, I'm going to be watching it, but Shannon's going to help me. And it would be easier if you had a question about a particular bill I'm focused on to answer it when I'm on that bill. So throughout the presentation today, I will be stopping to make sure there's nothing in the chat that I failed to notice that we could um, just answer right away. And of course, I will be keeping time at the end for more Q&A if other questions come up. And before I see any questions about this in the chat, again, just to reiterate, there will be a recording available uh, to all participants of today's webinar. We encourage you to share that with your colleagues, um, as well as the slides. This is a lot of information, probably a lot of note taking if you didn't have the slides. So rest assured, you will have them. So with that, let's get rolling on starting with our budget, taking a look specifically at the appropriations, which are specific line items in the budget that allocates money to a particular program, a particular state agency, or a particular initiative. So I'd like to start um, where I think maybe a lot of folks have been thinking about for the last several months, which is on VOCA, or our Victims of Crime Act funding. This is the federal funding stream that goes out to all states in the country, federal money, and New York uses this money to support victim service organizations through OVS subgrants. And we have been advocating for several years to address the dramatic shortfall in VOCA funding um, that's been coming into the state over the past recent years. To give you a sense, in 2018, our VOCA grant from the federal government was $199 million, so nearly $200 million. And this year's grant was just $44 million, so a loss of more than $155 million. This year, we really saw the governor and legislature come through for us as a broad group of victim service organizations with $134.4 million to address this shortfall in federal funding. So 34.4 million of that total 
will be used to ensure the continuity of existing contracts. So these are the contracts that will run from October 1st of this year through September 30th of next year. So OVS has sent around a very positive, clear email to all grantees saying these existing contracts will not be impacted. They will not be cut. Everyone can assume that they're going to get the same amount of money that they got, barring any budget changes um, that they got in year two. So this is very, very positive news for us. In addition, there's still $100 million left, which will be dedicated to the next procurement. So OVS has informed us that that RFA, the Request for Applications, will be issued early next year. Um, $100 million is would cover, at least what the state is thinking, would cover the first year of contracts. And the governor has made commitments to include subsequent $100 million appropriations in each of the next two budgets. So the 2025 budget and the 2026 budget for a total of $300 million. Now, I do want to point out that the existing three-year contracts total $373 million, so more than the $300 million that the state has committed to. I believe the governor is intending to, to use additional federal VOCA funding that comes into the state to supplement that $300 million. But we'll just have to wait and see what the RFA says when it's issued next year. So great news for us on VOCA. In addition, the governor uh, appropriated some funding for um, the prosecution of domestic violence to support prosecutors' cases against domestic violence offenders and to increase coordinated community responses in a very particular way focused on law enforcement and prosecution. So let me unpack that for you for a moment. The total appropriation is $35.7 million. $30 million of that is labeled as give money. So give is a program that the state has pursued over the last several years. It's an acronym that stands for Gun Involved Violence Elimination. And the give money goes out specifically to about 20 counties in the state where felony gun violence is at its highest. And the important thing about the GIVE funding is how it's distributed to those counties. So the state essentially asks the county to volunteer to participate in this program. So the leadership within that county says, yes, we want to accept this money. The money flows through law enforcement and through DA's offices to community-based organizations and together enhance the prevention of gun violence in those counties. Now, with respect to this money, this $30 million, what we're hearing from the state is this is going to be a domestic violence-focused give project. So we'll be somewhat the same in how the money is distributed down from the state into the counties, but will be different in that it will be focused on what the state is terming as high-risk domestic violence offenders. So it will include actions to reduce domestic violence, possibly include the use of risk assessments, maybe enhanced reporting. We don't really know all the details of this program yet. NISCADIV has met with DCJS to get some more information, and um, we hope to continue meeting with them to understand particularly what the role of domestic violence advocates will be 
with respect to this funding. Now, there is a smaller piece of the funding, this $5.7 million, which is going to be used outside of New York City to implement a pro program called DVSTAT, which is the Strategic Threat Alert System. Big words. But essentially what it does is it aims to collect evidence in the time period between a domestic violence incident and when an offender is apprehended. So apparently, often, this kind of evidence isn't retained and makes it difficult for prosecutors to um, successfully pursue a criminal investigation. So this would be social media, this could be texts, it could be emails, it could be photos. So this money will be dedicated to trying to lock down this evidence in that period of time immediately following a domestic violence incident, but before someone is actually apprehended. And apparently it's been pretty successful in Queens, which is where this program initiated. We were very pleased to see the governor include more funding for um, small financial assistance grants directly to domestic violence survivors. So $5 million was in last year's budget for this purpose. This year, another $5 million has been earmarked. And we understand that this commitment of the governor's will recur in future budgets to include this $5 million every year. And this is really wonderful funding for us. It is distributed by OPDV to local domestic violence programs, and they the money can be used for a variety of uses. The whole idea is that this is very low, um, low burden money. You know, they don't, survivors shouldn't have to give too much documentation or proof on how they're spending the money, because that's what we've really been pushing for, is no strings attached funding for survivors to get back on their feet. So we're really happy that this um, budget made it through and even thrilled even more that this is gonna recur in future budgets. So quickly running down some of the money that we see year to year with respect to domestic violence services, the money um, that is set aside at the county level for um, sh uh, shelter reimbursements, that's TANF and Title 20 funding, that those levels stayed the same as did the TANF funding for non-residential services. We see $3.2 million for that each year. That's still in there. Money for the human trafficking program, about two and a half million, that's in there. As well as we've, we've talked over the years that there is authorization in the budget for OCFS to conduct a pilot of a new methodology for funding domestic violence residential services. OCFS has not uh, conducted that pilot. It was first put in the budget at about the pandemic time and OCFS set it aside. We don't have any indications from OCFS that they intend to start that pilot, although we do continue to check in with them regularly because we are very supportive of uh, a pilot like that being done. The Enough is Enough funding stayed the same at four and a half million. There's the same amount of money set aside for DCJS to supervise community safety and restorative justice programs, and that specifically includes supports for survivors of domestic violence and sexual assault. Rape Crisis Services got the same amount of money, six and a half million. And uh, there was a repeat of $10 million for law enforcement to investigate and enforce ERPOs which are the extreme risk protection orders. And we saw that earmark for the first time last year, and it did make it in again this year. Now, in terms of new funding, uh, pretty exciting. The governor just issued a press release this week 
about $17.2 million to support her family-centered services initiative. And essentially, this money is going to be used to increase staffing at local departments of social services around the state. And this staff um, will be uh, doing case management services, which can include in-depth assessments, crisis intervention, resource navigation, and peer support um, to stabilize the individual's household conditions. So very positive. Um, I don't know exactly how. I think there in the press release there were some breakouts with the amount of money going to specific regions. If anyone was particularly interested in that, I direct you to the governor's press release. We saw a bump in the available funding for the sexual offense evidence storage facility in Washington County. This is the facility that stores materials before a survivor. Um, wants a criminal investigation to proceed, so before it's actually evidence. Um, last year, the facility facility received one and a half million. This year, that increased to four point one million. There was a significant increase in the amount of money the state set aside for assigned counsel, so that received a fifteen million dollar bump. And we also, for the first time, saw $2 million for DOCS um, for their supervision of high-risk domestic violence offenders on parole. So before anyone asks, I don't know how the state would identify someone as being high-risk um, while they're on parole. So that, to me, would imply someone who is at risk of recidivating. Um, I don't know how you would predict that, but I'm sure we'll hear more from the state about that. So before I move on to the policy initiatives in the budget, I uh, just want to check in with Shannon. Shannon, is there anything in the chat I need to be looking at? I put in the chat the localities for the family services um, money for DSS. Uh, there's a question from Jennifer that says, assigned counsel money, do we know if it's criminal or civil court? I don't, Jen. Thank you for the question. I can look into that, but I don't know offhand. I'll see if I can sort it. Okay, so let's move on to the Article 7 measure. So I just want to spend a second to uh, make sure everyone knows what Article 7 measures are. This is policy, so essentially legislation that the governor puts into the budget with the hopes that it passes the approval of the Senate and Assembly as part of the overall negotiation of the state budget. This is the governor's best opportunity to get policy approved in the state. Typically, it is policies that have some kind of financial implication, which is why it's in the budget, but not always. So think of it as the governor introducing her own bill. It just happens to be inserted into the budget. So there were a few Article 7s that I want to bring to your attention. Um, the first is one that provides paid leave for pregnant employees. This would be up to 20 hours of leave, and it's in addition to the existing paid family leave or disability leave that an individual already has access to. And this is specific for prenatal medical appointments or testing. And this is effective in January. So great news there. We also saw um, approval of paid time for employees to take to express milk. So this uh, policy requires employers to give these employees up to 30 minutes a day of paid break time to um, express milk. And if the employee wanted more time, then they can use existing break time or meal time that they have available to them. And the individual is eligible to use this time up to three years after childbirth. And this is effective right now. 
we see an expansion of doula services in the state. So this initiative authorizes the Department of Health to issue a statewide standing order for the provision of doula services to continue up until the child is a year old. And it also creates a program to expand doula services across the state by um, allowing community-based organizations to obtain funding for their efforts to recruit and train new doulas. And there would be particular focus on uh, community-based organizations that are working in historically vulnerable communities, as well as doulas who are bilingual. And that too is effective now. One of the initiatives that we've been working on as a movement for a couple of years is a new program um, to ensure that program that um, community-based organizations that support abortion providers as well as those who are accessing abortion get a get funding to do what they need to do. And this is a program called the Reproductive Freedom and Equity Grant Program. Now, what was done in this year's budget was not to set money for these grants. It created the structure of distribution. So that has to happen before the state can earmark funding. So that's what they did this year was they created that foundation to flow money to these abortion providers and nonprofits to ensure that individuals, either New Yorkers residing here now or individuals who come into New York to obtain abortion care can do so. And it's really intended to increase access to the care and to fund care that might not be covered by insurance, you know, to ensure all of this health care is still accessible and provided when needed. There was a great um, Article 7. I don't think this got a lot of media attention, and I'm sorry it didn't. So I, I appreciate the opportunity to talk about it today, which is to protect patients from medical debt. So essentially, this initiative prohibits hospitals from suing to recover medical debt if the patient has an income that's um, 400% below the federal poverty level. And it ensures that hospitals have to have policies in place to reduce charges for patients who are underinsured or not insured. And one of the key provisions is that an individual cannot be denied admission or treatment because they have unpaid medical bills. That's really a critical piece. And overall, it attempts to raise the income standards to ensure more people or are eligible for financial assistance for medical care. And another important part of this is that um, it restricts consideration of a patient's immigration status when determining financial assistance. So very, very key. So this will become effective in October. So uh, good cause eviction. There was a lot of conversation about this proposal last year's budget. Unfortunately, the legislature and governor couldn't make it happen. A version of it did get approved in this year's budget. It's a bit more narrow than what was proposed last year, but it's still a good first step. So essentially it applies to all of New York City. So the, the provisions that I'm gonna talk about right now applies to New York City. And in the rest of the state, local municipalities can adopt the provisions if they choose to. So it's offered to them, but it's not required. And actually we've already seen the city of Albany approve good cause eviction in their community. So essentially, it pro prohibits eviction of a tenant unless good cause is shown. 
And there's a couple of examples of good cause, which is failure to pay rent that is not associated with an unreasonable rent increase. If the tenant is a nuisance or if they are conducting illegal activity. And the proposal, the, the initiative, I should say, also caps rent increases in most market rate apartments. So we're going to have to see um, how this plays out if tenants are actually obtaining the protections that um, we were all hoping they would get under good cause eviction. It's a little too soon to tell. Um, I think if they are, then we might see the state move to um, actually requiring this in the rest of the state, not just in New York City, but we'll have to see. And the last Article 7 uh, that I wanted to bring to your attention is one that expands the definition for hate crimes. So you'll see all the bullets here. These are now added to, this is not the extent. So these are the new crimes that if perpetrated by an individual could be charged under the hate crimes statute if the factors of that case make it so. So it includes gang assaults, um, criminal obstruction of breathing or blood circulation, aggravated murder, many of the sexual offenses, criminal possession of a weapon, you can see them all here. So greatly expanding um, the ability of prosecutors to use hate crimes in their charging. So before we move on to uh, our legislation outside of the budget, Shannon, is there anything more in the chat I need to address? No. Okay, I'm going to take a drink of water. Always a lot of talking on this one, <laughs> which I do apologize for. Okay, so before we start talking about the, the uh, legislation that was approved by the Senate and the Assembly, so this is outside of the budget process now, um, once bills get approved by both chambers, it has to be an identical bill in both chambers, then it gets sent to the governor for the governor to act upon. This year, we saw the Assembly and Senate mutually pass 805 bills. That sounds like a lot, but it's actually 100 fewer than they acted on last year and 200 fewer than the year before that. So not a very efficient effective legislature this go around, but still they got 800 bills passed. Of that group, the governor has signed or acted upon about 26%. So only a quarter or so of the bills um, has she acted upon. We're still waiting on the vast majority of them. Now the governor typically, with one caveat, typically has until the end of the year to sign or veto bills. If she doesn't take any action on a bill by December 31st, then it's assumed to be vetoed. It's called a pocket veto. So I'm going to start by first talking about a few bills that sought to amend laws that were passed in 2023. So the first law is one that um, changes the definition of rape. And this is that caveat I, I just a moment ago said, in most instances, the governor has to sign a bill by the end of the year. This is a perfect example of the exception to the rule. So in 2023, the Assembly and Senate passed a bill to remove the penetration requirement from our state rape statute, and instead to expand the definition to include oral and anal sexual contact. So the intention here was to make it easier for prosecutors to prove that rape occurred when they couldn't specifically prove 
that penetration occurred. The governor felt that there was uh, clarity needed to this bill. So there was a lot of negotiation that was going on in the latter part of 2023, um, trying to resolve the governor's concerns that there could actually be some negative loopholes created um, if the bill was signed into law. In the end, there was an ano- a negotiated agreement where the bill got sent to her for her consideration at the very end of December, which then gave her into January to sign the bill into law, which she did, with an agreement that a second law passed, which is our fourth bullet here, that um, corrected those technical clarifications that the governor wanted to make to the initial bill. They're pretty technical. It's not really worth going through. I mean, the the most substantive change is that the effectiveness date changed from January 1st of this year to September 1st. Um, But now we definitely have a new definition for rape that removes the penetration requirement and includes oral and anal sexual contact. So staying on this theme of 2024 laws that were intended to amend laws that were passed last year, the first relates to um, a law that you're probably familiar with, our HOPE Cards legislation, which is the ability for a domestic violence survivor to get a wallet-sized laminated card from the courts with their detailed information about their order of protection on this card. This year, there was an amendment to that bill to also allow electronic versions of those cards to be um, to be sent to a DD supporter who requests it either by text or email. So this is at the survivor's choice. They can get both if they want. And either one is free. So this was an expansion of the ability to get a HOPE card electronically. We also saw a law in 2024 amend the 2023 law that required updated uh, training for mandated reporters. And this was a tweak to the uh, curriculum that is offered during the training. So now it includes guidance on identifying when a child with intellectual or developmental disabilities is abused. So a slight tweak to the curriculum, and it also extends the time frame for mandated reporters to receive the training to two years. I believe it had been one year before. As of a law in 2023, there was a great collaboration between uh, our state agency, OTADA, and utility companies to automatically enter eligible New Yorkers into the Home Energy Assistance Program, or HEAP. This year, a law was passed and approved by the governor, just providing a more feasible time frame for implementation of this. So it actually gives the utility companies and the state agency a full year to implement the program. And finally, we saw a tweak this year to the Adult Survivors Act, which clarifies that individuals who want to bring an ASA claim don't need to require a filing of notice of claim or a notice of intention to file. So we do have, we do have one question about the hope cards. Um, And the question was, are we current, are all counties currently required to provide hope cards? So the hope cards are provided by the courts. So yes, it, it is currently effective. But I know the real question is, can a survivor get a card right now? And that's the question I don't have an answer to, 
Um, we do have to check in with the courts to see what their progress is in creating, developing this program. I'm not aware that anyone has been able to obtain a HOPE card as of yet. I'm happy to be corrected if anyone participating today has worked with a survivor who has obtained a card, um, but it is something we plan to check in with the courts on. And it's OCA that's supposed to develop that program. Correct. Right? Correct. The Office of Court Administration. Right. Oop. I keep doing that. I lost my place. Okay. Sorry. Um, and uh, I see the other question there about which courts provide book cards. It is in both civil family court and criminal court. Okay, so the only action, the only new law that the governor has signed that relates to domestic violence and sexual violence, um, and that does not amend an earlier law, is this one which establishes more family court and civil court judge judgeships across the state. So this legislation adds 16 judges to New York's family courts. You can see the breakout there, four in New York City family courts, one in various upstate um, counties, and two each in Suffolk and Nassau. And the legislation also adds 12 judges to New York City civil courts. So that's three in each borough except Staten Island. So now with that, I'm gonna move on to the bills that are awaiting the governor's action. So remember I said about 75% of the 800 bills that the Senate and Assembly passed have not yet been sent to the governor. For her consideration, that's the um, step that then starts the clock ticking on 30 days for which she has to approve or veto a bill. One of the very first bills that we're urging the governor to act upon positively is the Safe Shelter Act, which is the Securing Access to Fair and Equal Shelter. This bill removes the financial incentives that DV shelters have for sheltering, sheltering families rather than individuals. So um, you're probably, if you're participating on this call, you're probably aware of the way that the state funds domestic violence residential services in the state. If a domestic violence survivor is in a bed in shelter on a particular night, the program gets reimbursed for that night. If a bed is open, the program does not get paid. When agencies house a single adult in a room with double occupancy, they only get reimbursed for the one bed. And we certainly, you know, it's not best practice to put strangers together. So in that situation, the second bed remains open. We did a little quick math, which you can see in the fourth bullet. If an agency had an individual adult in a double occupancy room for the 180 maximum days in shelter stay, that agency stands to lose $21,000 just for that one unit. Imagine that across a full shelter, across a full facility. That's a lot of money to lose. So what this would do if the governor signs it would require the state to essentially reimburse the program for the room. So to cover that pay differential for that open bed. So Niskative has been working in coalition with many DV service providers, probably some of you on the call today, to urge the governor to sign this bill. So if anyone wants to take some action after today's webinar, this is the one I think you should give a call, a shout out to the governor to get her to sign. We also have legislation that just sailed through the legislature, which was really amazing to see, which would prevent stalking via car remote technology. 
So what we've been seeing, we know abusers are very astute. They're using technology now to stalk and harass their victims. And that extends to the uh, computer technology in cars. We see abusers nearly using those tracking apps to uh, monitor where their victims are going, maybe where they're relocating. And in a couple of instances where survivors have asked car dealers to remove an abuser's access to the NAV system, to the apps, the car dealers have not been willing to do that. So essentially this bill would require car manufacturers and dealers to terminate an abuser's access to that technology within five days of the request. And this would be free of charge. It's pretty low burden. The survivor has to show that they legally possess the car. Um, and then they self-attest to their victimization. The car dealers would have to include information about this accommodation on their websites. And they also, I'm not exactly sure how they um, set this up, but I guess there's some kind of notice inside the vehicle that can turn on or can blink or I don't know, whatever, to show that the remote technology is being used to give the survivor um, that notice that someone is monitoring where they're going. I think it's like a notification. Like you imagine a notification on your phone, I think it works similarly to that. Thank you, Shannon. So another bill that got through the chambers this year is Melanie's Law. This is a bill that would focus on potential harm to family members of the intended victim. So let me unpack that. Um, we know that abusers often harm, in addition to the intended victim, other family members, siblings, parents, children, even friends, frankly. So currently, New York State permits a minor youth, someone under the age of 18, to get an order of protection, really to be on the intended victim's order of protection as a child to that person. What this bill would do would allow the courts to issue a new order of protection for any immediate family member or household member of the identified domestic violence victim, regardless of their age. This is, this, um, Bill was generated by um, a, a tragedy that happened in New York um, where a, an abuser who intended set out to murder his victim actually, in a case of mistaken identity, killed her adult daughter. And apparently the, the identified victim had sought protection for her adult daughter through the court prior to the murder, but the court didn't feel that they could extend protection to an adult uh, child. So this would correct that, and hopefully we won't see anything happen like that again. Another bill that will be in front of the governor is one um, to study uh, domestic violence in the trans community to try to um, evaluate and understand um, the extent of domestic violence, sexual violence, discrimination, and harassment among trans individuals and within trans communities. So OPDV would be tasked with doing this study, and ultimately OPDV would uh, prepare a report that includes recommendations to take action to reduce rates of domestic violence and sexual violence within that community. Um, one bill that we're kind of excited about um, is one that's focused on the way New York State contracts with nonprofits. 
Now, as a community, we've been talking for a long time about you know, the very long delays in executing contracts, getting contracts renewed, getting reimbursed for services and expenses. Um, we also know that there are requirements in state law that state agencies are not complying with. There are specific timeframes for contracting with nonprofits. There's a provision for getting advances to nonprofits if contracting is delayed, even provision of no interest bearing loans. We don't see any of that. At least I don't think we do. I haven't heard of anyone receiving any of those things. This bill would focus on one aspect of contracting, which is the renewal of contracts. And essentially, if a state agency um, does not abide by the current requirements for contracting in state law, they can be deemed as non-compliant. So in this sense, a state agency would be non-compliant if they fail to submit a renewal contract to the attorney general within this required time frame. If they fail to submit the renewal contract to the AG prior to the commencement of the contract, or if they in any way fail to fully execute the contract before the start date. So those are three reasons why they would be deemed non-compliant. And at that point, they would have to start essentially uh, they would become supervised by the state controller on that contract. So they would have to provide detailed information about the reasoning for the delay and how the state agency is going to rectify it by showing a payment schedule and, and hear me now, and they are to pay interest to the non nonprofit for any late payments against that contract. Now, this sounds really great, right? However, we know that state agencies have been non-compliant on existing statute for years. I don't know if this is going to be enough to prompt those state agencies to get themselves in compliance. We'll have to see. We also know it's just one piece of the very complicated contracting puzzle that is New York State's contracting system. So you can be sure that we will continue working to improve New York's contracting process with us. So now there's some other highlights within the uh, bills that have passed both chambers that are moving on to the governor um, for signature or veto. I'm going to run through these pretty quickly, but I can always come back to them if you have more questions. I did also want to point out, I should have said this earlier, that Shannon and I, um, as we do every year, prepare a very comprehensive legislative summary. It's about 20 pages and includes every bill that either becomes law, like for this year it will be in 2024, or bills that were vetoed, all of the policy initiatives in the state budget, as well as any bill that passed either the Senate or Assembly. So you can see what those chambers are working on, even though those bills didn't become law. So we're putting the finishing touches on our first iteration of that summary, but we continue to update that summary and post it on our DV directors listserv throughout the rest of the year as the governor begins to take action on the legislation. So there's more information about these bills that I'm going to run through as well as others on that summary. And we will provide that to all the participants of today's webinar, along with the slides by the end of the week. So first, um, there's a bill that's going to be moving on to the governor that would protect individuals from sexual assault by their probation officers. So this bill would specifically uh, dictate that individuals on parole cannot consent to sexual conduct with a supervising parole officer. So it removes that defense that a parole officer might use to say, 
well, she consented or he consented, they cannot consent. Second, we have um, in improvement, again, if this is passed, to the notice um, that goes out to families of um, homicide. So essentially, this bill would require our state office of victim services to provide notice to family members um, of their potential eligibility for victim compensation. I will say in our work on victim compensation, it's really clear so many New Yorkers aren't even aware that they could be eligible to receive victim compensation. So we really need to improve our process for informing those who are victimized that they could apply for victim compensation. And one aspect of this bill is to, to require OVS and DCJS to develop procedures for police to notice victims and victims' families of their potential eligibility, at least their ability to apply for victim compensation. There's a bill that would um, make sure ERPOs, the Extreme Risk Protection Orders, get reported into the statewide uh, registry of protection orders so that it's accessible to law enforcement when they're in their patrol cars. Another bill would create a task force to study fiscal cliffs in the state's public assistance programs. A fiscal cliff is when there's a sudden decrease in an individual's public benefits because they have received a very small, like incremental increase in their earnings, just enough to get them over the um, eligibility to receive benefits but still not a living wage. So this task force would look at that circumstance specifically and to see how we could prevent individuals from reaching that fiscal cliff. And we saw the chambers again pass a bill to create an advisory board focused on LGBTQ plus issues and bring recommendations to the state for actions that can be taken to better support that community. Um, this was a bill that was passed last year by the chambers, but the governor vetoed a number of bills, I think there were about 30 of them, that created various task forces, advisory boards, working groups. Um, so we're hoping that she will see the import for this one and sign this into law. Some bills I'm breaking out here that are specific to courts. Um, the first relates to a change that was made in 2022 with respect to sealing records of, of child abuse and neglect. So at that time, um, the decision was made to seal these records after eight years, although the information remains on the registry until the youngest child turns 18. So in other words, it cannot be used, um, it would not be provided to potential employers, but it would still be accessible to anyone who has access to the registry itself, so the state, essentially. Um, what this bill does is essentially updates the notice that the court provides to parties who, um, who are in child abuse and neglect proceedings in the state to make sure they understand that if they admit to child abuse or child neglect, that it will be accessible, that information will be accessible to potential employers for that eight-year period. Another bill would require um, that it, it would, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It would ensure the integrity of language interpretation in court documents. So essentially, it would require accusatory instruments um, or supporting depositions by witnesses or crime victims with limited English proficiency that the translator self-affirms to their qualifications um, and also describes specifically what they did, how they translated. So I'm not exactly sure about that piece, like what exactly that means. 
Um, but it is an attempt to ensure that those who are interpreting the communications of those with limited English proficiency are doing it accurately. There is another bill um, that would, that if signed, would permit affirmations rather than notarized affidavits in administrative proceedings. So we're starting to see this started last year. Um, courts move in the direction of permitting affirmations rather than burdensome notarized documents. Um, this bill would cover administrative proceedings like Article 78s, name change cases, even housing court proceedings. So this doesn't cover everything, but it's moving us in a direction of broader application of affirmations rather than that required notarized document. And some more still in the court um, um, arena is um, another expansion of the use of e-filing. Now, again, this is not a broad, you know, in all purposes kind of thing. We saw certainly since the pandemic, some courts um, using more use of e-filing. This would actually require e-filing in matrimonial cases, residential foreclosures, and consumer debt actions. And it would permit e-filing in essentially criminal court. So permits it, doesn't require it, permits it in New York City criminal court and then outside of the city, town, village, and city courts, which essentially act as the criminal courts outside of New York City. So the, we're definitely seeing, if, if the governor signs this, um, we're seeing a move to easier filing, right? Easier e-filing. Um, another bill, if signed, would update the child support guidelines. Um, so that the court considers the specific circumstances of the parties. This, there's a broad category here of what these circumstances are. It would include assets, residence, employment and job history, um, job skills, criminal record, age, health. And there's quite a, a grouping here of circumstances. Um, so we'll see how the governor acts on that bill, as well as a bill um, that would expand the venue options for parties of matrimonial proceedings. Um, now, in addition to being a venue within the county where either party resides, the case could also be heard where any minor children of the marriage reside, if that's different. So a potential expansion there, a venue option. And finally, I just wanted to turn to some um, legislation, again, all of which has not yet been signed into law. We have to see what the governor does with these bills, but they have passed both chambers relative to health care. So first, there uh, would be creation of a maternal health care and birthing standards work group. And they would make recommendations to the state regarding the development of standards to ensure the highest quality of care with respect to maternal health. Another bill would provide information to patients regarding any um, exclusions of service. And I think this is, you know, thinking in mind of reproductive health care and abortion. So, you know, Prospective patients, as they are admitted, would get information about policies the hospital has in place that would exclude provision of certain health care. So the patient can make an informed decision of whether they want to be admitted into that facility. There's a bill that would uh, require any hospital that was uh, interested in closing their doors to do a community needs assessment, and the state would only approve the closure of that hospital if the needs of the community can be met. And we're talking about needs like maternity, emergency, mental health, substance use, 
And that bill also requires a pretty detailed public notice and engagement process before the hospital can be closed. Another bill um, relates to ensuring pregnant women can get health insurance at any time without penalty. So that's a, a great development. Hope the governor signs that into law. As well as one that would provide um, hospital facility information to prospective maternity patients. Um, this is a little bit different than the bill, the earlier bill I just mentioned. Um, it looks at what the hospital would do um, if either the pregnant individual or the infant becomes critically ill. What are their transfer policies? Do they have written community needs assessment to reduce racial disparities um, on a, upon a stillbirth? Is it their policy to do an, um, an autopsy? And do they provide bereavement support um, in cases of stillbirth or fetal loss? So again, just the idea of providing more transparency about hospital policies to patients. So that's a lot. I think that's all of the legislation I wanted to cover today. There are several other bills that the Assembly and Senate passed um, that are important, which will be covered in our legislative summary. Um, we'll definitely report on those too as we you know, give you information on the governor's actions on these bills, but just too much for us to cover in this you know, one and a half hours that we have with you today. So before I, I get it and start looking toward 2025, Shannon, is there anything in the chat I should be addressing? Uh, no, I think we've covered the issue of the Hope Card and um, everything else that needed to be addressed in the public space. Okay. Well, I'm going to quickly cover um, our thoughts on 2025. And as I'm doing that, if anyone does have questions about the legislation we've covered today or the budget appropriations, please don't hesitate to put your question in the chat and we'll leave time for Q&A. Um, as I go through these next few, after I go through these next few slides. So what does NISCADIV expect to be working on in 2025? We certainly expect to be very laser focused on what we see in the governor's executive budget. Um, we certainly expect to see that additional VOCA funding next year. Um, but, you know, our um, approach, our attitude is that New York's take on funding for domestic violence services has been flat funding for years. Flat funding. So even with this additional funding in the state budget for VOCA, that's not an increase in funding. That's maintained funding. We know that demand for our services is through the roof. We have the highest demand for domestic violence services in the country. So we're being asked to support more individuals experiencing domestic violence with the same amount of money. And that's why we're all in crisis mode. So we're going to continue elevating that need to the state and hopefully see more dollars being support for support for our services in next year's budget. We also want to look again at reducing the administrative burdens on domestic violence advocates. We know many programs in the state operate under 20 to 30 contracts. We talked earlier about the challenges in administering all of those contracts. There's a lot of redundancy across the state agencies. There's the time it takes to actually get paid for the services that we provide, particularly on the residential side with the per diem. So we're going to be working on all of these issues as we head into 2025. Along with the issue of living wages for domestic violence advocates, we saw a great bill introduced by Senator Persaud and Assemblyman Hevesy um, to extend COLAs not only to domestic violence advocates, but really to all VOCA victim service organizations. Unfortunately, that didn't pass. We're going to continue our advocacy on that in 2025, for sure. 
And I think we're going to watch very closely the state's rollout of this $36 million for changes to the domestic incident report, um, maybe recommendations or best practice with respect to lethality assessments, who is conducting those lethality assessments, the training on those assessments. Um, also, with respect to the inclusion of community-based organizations in that fuel of funding for coordinated community response. So a lot of questions there about how that money will be distributed and used and what our role will be as domestic violence advocates um, in those communities that receive that funding. With respect to legislation, um, we've got a great coerced debt bill that was introduced by Assemblymember Rosenthal, really hoping that 2025 will be the year that we get that one approved. Uh, there's also the bill that would require um, confidential, not anonymous reports to the Child Abuse and Neglect Registry. And that's really important because we know that abusers um, one of the tactics they use is to make anonymous reports to that register, um, saying that their victim, that their victim is uh, harming ch their child. Um, and each individual CPS report has to be investigated as a separate report, right? So that's a lot of time that survivors are spending to kind of counter this erroneous information that's reported to the CPS hotline. There's um, a, a bill to ensure that the public assistance that uh, individuals receive for housing is set at 100% fair market rent in that community. We know that those allowances have not been elevated in a long time and they're just too low, right? You can't get a, a unit for the rent you know, that we're getting out of our local departments of social services. Um, we're really hoping, Shannon and I, to come back to the enhanced protections for survivors who seek to break uh, bundled or family contracts for their phone, their cable, utilities. Uh, this was a bill that was intended to be passed when the first bill passed enabling domestic violence survivors to obtain this accommodation, there's some additional um, accommodations, uh, I'm sorry, additional protections that we want to put in place, such as ensuring that um, the telecom companies don't transfer any of the billing responsibility from one account holder to the other. So if the abuser is the first one to seek the accommodation, they can't leave the survivor with the financial liability of that contract. And also preventing the company from saying they don't want to enter a new contract with an individual who sought an accommodation on a prior contract. So just providing some additional protections for survivors who seek the accommodation. There's a really good bill, and I think this is going to become more and more important, um, that relates to the privacy of healthcare records. We're definitely seeing the shift. Maybe you've seen it in your, your own personal appointments um, with doctors, that doctors are now shifting to um, accessing records and communications with doctors to online apps. And it's very important that the privacy of that information is held intact um, and that abusers don't get access to survivors' health information through those apps. So this would require consent before the um, app administrator either collects data on a patient's behalf or shares any of that personal data. Very important. And a couple of other bills that we only see in the Senate, but we're going to be looking hopefully to expand in the Assembly. One is to require legal representation for evictions, and the other to end predatory fees and fines. These are the small, relatively small fees that anyone who is convicted of charges in New York State just gets automatically applied to their tab, 
And then they, you know, it, they have to pay interest if they can't pay. And before you know it, they're they're in quite a bit of debt because of these fees and fines. Joan, if we could um, take a couple of questions from the chat. One is a question regarding colas. And they're wondering if we were successful in obtaining colas, would um, attorneys or legal staff be included, or is it just limited to advocates? Well, the the Senator Persaud bill um, includes a, a swath, a wide swath of individuals. Um, when it speaks about individuals working at domestic violence agencies, it is not specific. It just speaks to advocates and staff. Um, so I'm not sure if the individual who's asking is actually employed at a domestic violence agency or not. If not, um, they very well might be covered if they receive VOCA funding, because it does include all VOCA recipients, all victim service organizations that receive VOCA funding. Or they could, if they obtain funding through another state agency, they could also receive, be eligible to receive the COLA. So that's about as specific as I can get. Was there another question, Shannon? There are some other questions in the Q&A, um, and I'm doing my best to answer them there and then encouraging people to reach out to us um, offline after this if they're not germane to what's specifically passed this year. Okay. Well, I think my, my last slide is just to look at um, what's in store in 2025 with respect to the courts. And I did want to elevate Kira's Law for all of you. Hopefully you're familiar at this point with Kira's Law. Um, Niskative has been working extremely hard. I actually don't think there's another bill that we've worked quite as hard on um, than Kira's Law, maybe bail reform. Um, but anyway, the intention is to prioritize the safety and well-being of children during child custody and visitation proceedings. So this would require the courts to conduct an evidentiary hearing um, at the request of either of the parties uh, to one of these proceedings and to really hear evidence about um, child safety. So we think this is really critical. We were close this year. We think the bill is really in great shape. Um, so we're hoping 2025 is the year we really are working hard to make this one happen. And with respect to other issues, really, in family court, um, Senator Boylman Siegel has um, introduced a, a really good supervised visitation bill that we're working with uh, him on. We want to resurrect our work on a bill that would ensure access to um, child custody evaluator reports. Access to these reports is very inconsistent across the state, so we want to make sure that if you're a party to um, a proceeding where a child um, custody evaluator prepares a report, that you as a party to that proceeding gets a copy of it. And we're still of a mind that we should be eliminating forensic evaluators entirely from child custody and visitation proceedings. If we can't get that far, then there are a couple of bills that would uh, limit their impact, one, by ensuring that forensic evaluators who, because of bad actions, have been determined to no longer be able to serve in New York's courts, that they can't then jump across the table to the witness stand and become an expert witness, which we have actually seen one individual do. Um, and we also want to eliminate the quasi-immunity that forensic evaluators receive in court. No other court personnel, no attorneys, no judges, you know, have this access to complete immunity. Actually, I think judges do. I might have misspoke there. Um, so we don't think forensic evaluators should have immunity. They should stand by their reports and be able to testify in support of them. And unrelated to family court on the criminal side, um, you likely saw some of the coverage about the Harvey Weinstein case where um, some of the uh, survivors who offered evidence in his trial um, were later deemed, it, it was later deemed to be inappropriate that the court allowed those other survivors to provide testimony. 
So uh, Senator Paulin has introduced, she actually had this bill in advance of that latest ruling um, to allow evidence of a defendant's prior sexual assault or assaults to be admissible in those cases. And we think that's a really important bill, and we'll be working on that in 2025. So just a sen- we just want to I'd love to graduate um, Assemblywoman Paulin to Senator, but Assemblywoman Paulin. <laughs> she does pretty good in the assembly, though, I have to say. Very good. Very good. Gets the most bills passed of anyone. That is true. That's the word on the street. So as we wait a couple of minutes to see if there is anything more in the chat, I do want to just post our 2025 advocacy events. Um, for you to to save the date, get on your calendar right now. We are making a little bit of a switcheroo um, with respect to our advocacy events. In the past, our big event was Legislative Day of Action, which typically hit in late April or May. We're just finding that that's happening a little too late um, in the legislative season for us. So our bigger event of the two next year is going to be Budget Advocacy Day, which we hold in February. We have already reserved the well, as some of you might be uh, familiar in the legislative office building, um, for that day. And of the two, if you uh, are able and willing to come to Albany and participate, we encourage you to be with us on February 24th. And that's going to be our big event. And then we are reserving another day in April, April 29th, as our legislative day of action to talk to legislators about important legislation um, that we want to pass before the end of session next year. So I see there's a question about uh, judicial accountability. Um, No, I think, is that, I have to put my glasses on. Is that Nisa? Oh, and Lee, Lee, Lee. Lee. Um, I'm sorry, it's a little too far away. Uh, no, Lee, I am not familiar with a bill um, that would um, hold judges accountable if there's even serious harm to a child who is party to a proceeding in family court. Um, we've been thinking about a bill to require sort of a... Um, I apologize for the term, but a postmortem, which is often done, you know, that hospitals do if there's a bad outcome um, in that facility. Um, But in a similar vein, we know that there's um, two fatality reviews that can occur in New York, not in the courts. So OPDV has a fatality review team focused on the intended victim and OVS also, um, I'm sorry, OCFS, excuse me, OCFS has a fatality review team. We are really thinking through, you know, should there be something similar in the courts, but nothing as of yet. Happy to talk more about that too. And Ingrid, I see you're asking a question about Kira's law. Um, yes, so Kira's, uh, Kira's law does extend representation. Um, yes. So the answer is yes. I just wanted to make sure I read your whole comment. And I've been putting in the chat, oops, sorry, I got an alert that just covered it up. Um, you know, judges are elected in New York. So there is the possibility of holding people to account at the ballot box. True. I want to, uh, I just want to call our emails, just if anyone wanted to follow up with us um, after today's presentation, Shannon, go right ahead. So there was a question in the Q&A that if there's space to answer with a few minutes left, I'll, um, I'd will i like to bring to the room, um, which is, is, do we know if the funding being distributed for New York State for the coordinated community response um, will go to victim, as- to victim assistance? And, and my sense was that the money will be going to uh, service providers to participate in coordinated community response programs. Do you want to add anything to that? It's, it's been hard for us to figure out exactly how the money is going to be distributed. 
Yeah, I don't think we have any clarity from the state on which community-based organizations would be working in tandem with law enforcement um, and the counties um, on that program. So the way it's been described to us is that the head of the county, which would mean in most cases the county executive, um, would volunteer to participate in the development of this program within that county. The county would be tasked with putting together a report, a plan, if you will, of how the funding would be used. So it would be the county that brings in local stakeholders to support that plan. And it would be the county, along with DCJS, that would determine how much funding would be distributed to which stakeholder groups. So there could be counties that don't engage with community-based organizations at all. And the county takes all the money and works with law enforcement and courts, and they do whatever they're going to do. And then I can see another county who is very engaged with local stakeholders and pulls in a wide group of um, nonprofits to help support the initiative and maybe get funded under that. I have a lot of questions about that myself. We just have to wait and see what we hear from DCJS about the rollout. And then um, I'll, I'll really invite some of the folks who have been on the Q&A talking about issues with ADA compliance and retaliation for judges to reach out to Joan and I separately. We have held a couple of listening sessions, which is the space where this conversation would have, um, we would have been able to provide a little more space to have that conversation. And we've also been sharing information with um, the Family Court Justice Initiative, I think it's called. Um, they're the Family Justice Initiative. Family Justice, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so please share these issues with us. Um, we're happy to set up a call, you know, email us and we can set up a time to talk. Um, and we will feed that information back um, as we continue through the summer into the next, into the fall um, with the stakeholders who are engaged in and lead those, either the courts or the institutions that you have concerns about. Yeah, and, and since it does sound like we do have some legal professionals with us today, um, I do want to highlight that we will be offering this similar webinar, but probably updated with Empire Justice Center to the DV Task Force in September, and that's going to be in person, um, which is exciting because it hasn't been in person in several years, and also with the Crime Victims Legal Network um, in December. So by then, we should really understand what the governor's actions have been on most, if not all, of these bills. Well, I see it's 3.30. Thank you so much for being here today. I will stay on for another minute or two just to make sure there's nothing else in the chat. Um, but we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. And see Catherine's note, um, another sort of uh, judicial accountability kind of concept um, about, you know, if if someone were to complain about a judge, um, how can they be protected? I'm actually not really certain that there's a, a clear process for complaining, you know, whether that's because of the judge, whether that's because of assigned counsel, whether that's because of a forensic evaluator. So, you know, these are really the um, types of issues that we're looking at when we talk about judicial accountability. And I think we we would have to ensure the um, protection of the complainant, you know, because if, if someone lodges a complaint and that then impacts your case, obviously that's not a successful way to achieve accountability for the judge or court personnel. Um, but I am not aware of any kind of bill right now on judicial accountability. So definitely something for us to work on in the future. There is a commission on judicial conduct, um, but I'd have to take a deeper dive um, and see exactly what the parameters of their work are. It might just be for folks who are actually charged with misconduct 
or we're formally charged. But um, like I said, please reach out to us with our emails and we all do some of that work. All right. Well, it feels to me like maybe we should close up. Um, thank you all for being here. Um, shout out to my colleagues who supported with tech and to our interpreters. Great appreciation for you all. Have a good rest of the day.